Well, hello and uh, welcome to another exciting episode of, uh, of Pod of the Gaps, the podcast that tackles everyday, challenging and uh, lively cultural issues from a Christian perspective. My name's Andy Bannister and I'm joined as uh, as ever uh, by uh, Michael Otts and uh, Aaron Edwards from their various ends of the country. How are you, uh, how are you lads doing today? Pretty good, thank you. Good, thank you. When you say other ends of the country, I really am other ends of the country today because uh, I'm about as far away from you as possible in the uh, the British Isles, I think. And so, so where are you right now? Then you're uh, that would make you what Devon, Cornwall, sort of that end of things. I'm guessing. Cornwall is correct. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, yeah. Very, very nice. Excellent. Very nice. Surfing's surfing's pretty good. Surfing's pretty good. It is. It was very nice just, first thing this morning. Yeah. Just make sure you make the make make the scone correctly. You know, that's uh, for, for listeners not aware of the some of the tribes of the UK. There is a massive division down in the southwest to go. You take your scone or your scone, depending on how you pronounce it. And, you know, does the jam go on first and the cream or the cream and then the jam? That is, I mean, tr- wars have been fought over less. <laughs> than I, I used to, I used to yeah. work in a coffee shop where we, we got we've started making clotted cream and uh, providing little pots of clotted cream with our scones. And then for the first months you would have people returning it and go this cream is off kind of returning it and showing it <laughs> with the, with the, you know when you, when you show the kind of clot a bit over the top and I was like no no that's how it is no no I know what cream looks like I don't think you do this is clotted cream what do you think the clotted refers to it is a clot and well the actually the reason it's argument. called the reason it's called clotted cream is I've often had the privilege of hosting American and Canadian friends here and taking them out for you know, so a good old uh, English or Scottish cream tea. And the question about what is this cream thing turns up. And I said, the reason it's called clotted cream is that's what it does to your arteries. So, uh, you, know, to go, yeah. so you know, have one too many cream teas and your, your blood turns to sludge. Um, but it's still very yummy. <laughs> Talking about cream going off, my computer's about to go off if I don't turn the plug on over there. So just, you know, not that the uh, listeners need to know this, but uh, my fellow participants on this podcast might wonder why I'm about to disappear for about the next second. So I'll just leave you to continue to talk about clotted cream. This is very exciting. And to go for, you know, regular listeners of the show, you'll be very pleased to know that the professionalism uh, is up at its normal level. You know, we make sure we're ready. Everything's turned on. Computers are charged up. You know, people are dressed appropriately. <laughs> Andy, and, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't this be a great time to plug the Patreon account? Wouldn't this be the, the ideal opportunity to say, you know, thank you for your donations? Keep yes, while well, Michael is away, while well, Michael is away figuring out how to make a computer work, um, you know, we are really excited to see how the listenership for the uh, the show has uh, has grown. And uh, but uh, it would be really great if you enjoy Pod of the Gaps. We now know there's about three or four hundred of you listening to every episode. To go, this thing does cost a small amount of money to make. We have. Sort of hosting fees and other kind of bits and bobs not a lot but it's it's there so if you go to our uh our patreon account there's a there's a link in the show notes and so if you visit our soundcloud page there's a link there as well hugely appreciate it if uh if you can get behind us we've had a two or three people kind of chip in already our goal is to sort of get to sort of maybe sort of 40 or 50 uh pounds a month and then not merely can we continue to pay our hosting fees and not go bankrupt but also hey we might actually be able to improve our kit maybe afford to buy michael a power lead for his uh his yeah. Great. Uh, so he hasn't got to go and sort of run out the room and uh, and, and find the exercise bike with the dynamo. I okay. should hasten. Andy, I've noticed by the way that you're you're looking uh, very uh, dapper this evening. You're normally sort of dressed in a t-shirt, shorts, if that. Really, you know, we don't ever see what's on the bottom half, but right now we can see you in a, a lovely kind of blue slash lilac. No, it's got it's just blue, isn't it? Uh, shirt. As if you're ready this to This is Oxford, Oxford blue, my friend. Oh, this yeah. is on Oxford blue shirt. Yes, this is very true. Normally, I do live a fairly slovenly uh, existence. In fact, often I'm just there in sort of you know sort of skins and and, and sandals. <laughs> if I've sort of killed a couple of rabbits or something. Apologies to vegans are listening. And uh, but uh, no, today is my uh, my lovely wife's birthday. So um, the minute we finish recording this show, I am I am dashing out. Uh, to take her to dinner because actually you know we still got covid restrictions going on in the uk but in scotland we are more advanced than you lowly english people and we can have dinner inside so tonight we're going to a lovely country house hotel to celebrate her well she's 21 again it's uh, every year my wife's 21. so we need so basically you're telling me michael we need to open fresh cans of worms by the end of the conversation so that you know you, you can't really end the conversation uh 
you know, that, uh, that, that could be it. And the most amusing thing here is obviously though is trying to navigate the kind of raft of, of COVID rules because yes, we can we can eat dinner inside, but we have to be finished by eight o'clock. We can't have alcohol with the meal unless we're sitting outside, in which case we can have alcohol with the meal and we can eat until I think it's ten o'clock. But I think we can have a glass of wine inside without a meal, I think. <laughs> Um, but if we stay at the hotel, we can have both those things brought to our room with room service. So I love the fact that our, our politicians, I don't know what it's like at your part of the country, I think literally decided, how can we make you need a PhD to understand uh, these things? I, I thought they sit there going, oh, this will mess with their heads. Let's let's do it this way. People can gather a group of six unless one of them is called Susan, in which case it's a group of nine. Um, but there we are. It is very somewhat, somewhat like a game show, isn't it? I think you mentioned a yeah, crystal. It is a bit like a game show. COVID, COVID regulations of the week, but of I course there is the being... weakest link. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say it's all being led by the science, of course. Um, the all science, which the also science. says let's let's not get let's not get cynical here or go down any any kind of too many rabbit trolls, or we'll get uh, we'll get people complaining, uh, particularly politicians. And politicians is a very weak link to um, where we're going today <laughs> because listeners may be going, okay, fine. Uh, can we get to the topic? What is the topic for the week? The, the the banter is great, but we you know you British people, you need to get to the point. And the topic we want to explore this week, we've got a totally uncontroversial topic. No possible controversy here nobody could get annoyed with us no angry tweets are going to come our way because we're going to look at the question of can a christian be a nationalist can a christian be a nationalist and the backstory to this question is and i'd love to go and get your uh, your take on this uh gentleman is um you know i before i lived in in scotland i lived in canada and this is where one of the things where i first really encountered this whole question of christianity and nationalism because i noticed in many canadian churches there was the Canadian flag on the wall. Now we may associate, particularly those of us listening to this in 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 Europe, you know, the whole flag on the wall of church is an American thing. Well, Canadians do it too. And then, get this, the Sunday school that my like three year old was attending, we discovered that they were singing the Canadian national anthem hmm. at the start of every Sunday morning. And it was only when we complained uh, yeah. in a very polite way, and the Sunday school teacher was, "Oh, what's the problem?" We went, "Well, you know, it's um the church is not the state. There is a difference." But actually, eventually, they stopped doing that. And then, of course, I moved back here to to uh, the UK. Now live in Scotland, where nationalism stalks the land. Uh, we had our we had Scottish elections here last week, and the Nationalist Party, the SNP, has nationalism baked into its name. The Scottish National Party, thankfully, not the uh, they haven't got the, the thankfully it's SNP, not NSP. That would be a different type of certain national <laughs> party. And uh, uh, you know, is everywhere, and it's really interesting to come across Christians who are deeply into this and i think i i guess i have a lot of concerns and so i suppose my mm. question for kicking off folks is am i right to be concerned i mean is there is there is there a problem here is is nationalism something we should be a little bit worried about maybe before we get to the the christian angle on it but just generally is nationalism a thing we should be concerned about what do we think yeah i think to to kick off i'd say um i guess one of the dangers is it's when you're in a culture, um, you're often blind to things in your culture. So speaking as someone who was born in England, lives in England, um, maybe the ability to see nationalism in my own context is harder. But like you said, sometimes when you go to other contexts, it's easier to sometimes see that where it kind of grates and you think um, there seems to be an elevation of one's allegiance to the state that seems somewhat unhealthy. Um, what actually struck me a few years ago was when I went to Germany and Germany just won the World Cup and um, and there was a kind of you know right sense of kind of celebration and everything else but what was interesting chatting to people there was saying actually ever since the end of the Second World War like any sense of patriotism is seen as a bad thing um, in Germany because obviously they see where nationalism led them and it was interesting seeing there that actually there was a, a much greater sense of patriotism we have potentially nationalism in the UK, in the different parts of the UK than, than they had there um, at that time because they saw where it had gone historically, which I thought was fascinating. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting, Michael, you make the reference to sport as well because it is something that, you know, we can't get away from the fact that though we're not in a, um, a kind of pro-nationalist, you know, moment, I guess. Well, maybe we are, some would say, in the UK. I think, generally speaking, a lot of people would be suspicious of nationalism. Not only, you know, not least Germans, of course, but also those who are involved. The other European nations are also aware of the danger nationalism did 
around them. And, and of course, you know, European nations on the, on the Allied side in the war were also uh, fairly nationalist as well in different ways uh, in trying to combat that. I do think it's interesting that sport is more popular than ever. Um, and, you know, we're about to go into kind of a, you know, European championships in football. And it's just interesting. What does it actually mean to people to be connected to their nation, to be to be connected? It does mean something. And it's not necessarily a horrendous thing that they want to support their country. But what on earth does it really mean that you're supporting vicariously a sports team that, that represents your nation? There's something in there of a kind of national pride mm. That has to be, it can't be all bad. And in some ways, maybe sport replaces war in that sense, because you're sort of, you know, you're almost wanting to show off your, uh, the, the, what your nation is capable of in some way. So it can't be that it's an entirely wrong thing. Or if it is, we bet Christians and others better be quicker to say, right, we must ban all of this national uh, support for your, for your country mm-hmm. or, or ban international sport. That would be, that would cause an outcry. And interestingly, even cause an outcry. I know you guys aren't major football fans, aren't you? But you, uh, there, there was a thing with this the uh, European Super League that kind of went crazy on social media <laughs> and ended within a week because of the, the protests at the death of our national game. Mm-hmm. And you think no one, you know, that's, that's what brought riot, football is what brought riots out because it was a connectedness to the kind of mm-hmm. historic heritage of, of how football works in this country particularly that was being un- that kind of threatened. So it almost brought people together, galvanised them, in a way, even though it's for what might seem like a pretty frivolous, um, you know, uh, uh, endeavor compared yeah. to many other things, but it, it does totally depend on the context you're in, of course, because I don't see nationalism as a terrible thing, as a terrible threat right now in the UK. I can see it in other nations, but obviously there've been other other places where that that's more difficult. So you, Andy, for example, are in Scotland, aren't you? And I, I spent a few years there, and I saw mm. you know, I was there during the um, independence vote uh, first time round, and it was. Interesting to see the kind of signs up and the kind of fear and the discussions happening. It was a very different sort of place. I presume you've got some insights from where you are hmm. on, on how this plays out differently. Yeah, it's been very interesting here, actually, because, of course, I, I wasn't here for the first independence referendum in uh, in 2014. Uh, I mean, it's, it seems ages ago. It's almost a generation ago. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, it seems a long time back. But I think, obviously, we've had the, the most recent election when, when it got very, 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 you know, I think almost toxic in place. So I think a couple of things intrigued me here with, with the nationalism, you know, that you see here. Uh, in in Scotland, one is the fact that actually it can cover a whole variety of failures. So the risk of you know this getting probably you know all kinds of angry comments on social media because the because uh, they're quite well mobilised. So you know the SNP, the national the, the party here, who basically are been a power now for you know some considerable length of time, are actually pretty useless when it comes to actually everyday things like running health and education and everything else. Mm-hmm. You know failure after failure after failure. But lo and behold, you know the first minister Nicola Sturgeon can come out and she can wave the national, she can blow the nationalist whistle you know vote for me because i will get you independence and people ignore it i mean i've had conversations with people where i've said well forget that issue uh you know mm. what about you know this 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 and well those, those issues don't matter i just want somebody who can who can mm. get his independent nation and that i think that's slightly worrying you know historically when we've seen leaders able to basically behave as they like but simply yeah. blow the whistle and uh and people will vote i've you know my wife and i've often joked that you know probably nicola could be filmed on live tv cutting the heads off kittens and her vote would still hold up <laughs> because people would go, okay, nationalism. So that worries me slightly. And then personally reflecting on the fact that, you know, we're not the kind of people who put political signage up. We, we don't play that game. But today there was lots of political signage in our part of Scotland, in our part of um, Dundee, and it's a pretty, you know, nationalist-leaning city. My hunch is, it, you know, I remember thinking, well, if I had wanted to put a, you know, a pro, the other party sign on my lawn, I think I'd have been afraid, actually, the old brick through the, the window. Now, some of these things might go, well, Andy, that's because you're an Englishman in Scotland, right? And to go, there's a whole issue there. Well, aside from the fact that is, of course, racism, there's also the issue. I have plenty of friends who live here in Scotland who have come from other parts of the world. I have friends who've come from China or or India, Pakistan and, and other places. And I've heard many of them say that they almost feel that if they don't sort of sign up to be card carrying members of the pro independence mob they are the wrong sort of immigrant in fact somebody said they were called that on social media because they tweeted something and someone told you are the sort of immigrant we don't want here Hmm. and i'm like well okay that's interesting so i think there's a bigger there's a there's a bigger problem um going on but a question i would like to throw back to to you guys for a minute is there's so many things we can explore in this you know i think there's a big discussion and we'll get into as to you know where does nationalism which i think is bad i think we're you know we're we're, going to wave the flag for that and so we think there is a 
problem there. We'll probably explore more why. Yeah. And where does it segue into perhaps patriotism and things that are, that are, that are healthier? But one of the things I'm intrigued by is this human tendency we have to divide into into tribes. I was doing you know a bit of um, sort of prep before the show because of course when I host I always do preparation. I know Michael just comes in from surfing, but you know I actually read books and things. Um, one of my one of my best reads of the last year was the book The Coddling of the American Mind by uh, Jonathan Haidt and, and Greg mm-hmm. Lukianoff. Um, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. And for Europeans listening, we can't get smug because everything he critiques American culture for, and he is American, applies to Europe too. But he tells the story that there's some very famous experiments um, done uh, early in the middle of the 20th century by the Polish psychologist Henri uh, Tajfel, uh, who'd who's a, who a social psychologist and he uncovered what's now termed in psychology the the uh, minimal group paradigm and basically what he did he took a cohort of folks randomly divided them into groups based on something totally arbitrary a coin toss was mm. one way he did you know toss heads tails right you're the heads group you're the tails group mm. then he got each group uh to divide resources you know sweets chocolate cake money um among the whole group and, yeah. uh, and decide how many who got what amount of resource and without fail each group gave more to their own group members than to the other group even though it was a purely arbitrary division hmm. and what that i think uncovered and uh and um jonathan and greg talk about this a bit in this book the way that social media has made this even worse today is we have this sort of inbuilt temptation to divide each one another into tribes so you're hmm. my tribe you're not my tribe and then start discriminating against the tribe that we're not part of and i were i wonder whether nationalism and one of the reasons why nationalism is so toxic is it gives you such an easy way of doing that you know you're yeah. for us you're against us yeah. you're one of us you're not one of us and it becomes such an easy way to divide people rather than bring people together what do you what do you think just just on that which is interesting um again to use football as an illustration i was in um serbia recently and uh uh Obviously, you might know that there's a big kind of rivalry in uh, Belgrade between Red Star Belgrade and Partizan Belgrade when it comes to football, when it comes to basketball and so on. Um, and it's interesting because obviously in, in some cities in the UK, that um, division comes kind of on historical kind of nationalist religious grounds, you know, whether you're Catholic or Protestant or whatever. Um, so I was kind of asking, where does this stem from? You know, how do you decide whether you support Partizan or Red Star? And it's like, well, you just decide. So I was like, well, well, how? I was like, well, you just you just pick a team when you're a kid. Like everyone who lives in Belgrade just picks a team. And then once you pick your team, you know who you hate. And literally people get killed over this. And yet there's absolutely like no, it's completely arbitrary. Like as you get one family and one kid will pick one team and one kid will pick the other. And then they'll literally be kind of like at each other's throats physically like because of this. So I think it illustrates that idea that actually we can... We can divide over anything, you know. Yeah. We can say, "Well, it's religion the problem," but we can pick things, and then we we retreat into our clan or tribe, as it were, and the other people become the enemy. And um, mm. even when we know at the bottom of mm. at the end of the day, there's there's no actual reason that we're any different to them. Yeah, in that sense. Mm. yeah that's so true. There's this sort of dehumanizing, isn't there, of the other that that mm. happens naturally in any tribe. And it's mm. funny that you know we do encourage sport does encourage that, doesn't it? in a sense not dehumanizing so much but a kind of it's not like a hatred but a kind of animosity i i enjoy you know as a as a liverpool fan i enjoy the animosity between liverpool and manchester united it's not and i don't think i would want it not to be there i think it's part of the tension and competition which is really difficult if you just made everyone really friendly with each other all the time in those situations i don't think sport would be very interesting if there wasn't a mythology around mm different people wanting to beat each other but within sport it's good because you know you know they don't actually kill each other and things afterwards it's the fans that sometimes then tribalize that in a really unhelpful way and the dehumanizing actually um Mm. actually then happens to a really significant Mm. and kind of scary degree as we've seen in various political movements as well so the interesting thing that occurs to me there as you describe that of course is that that again that kind of tipping point that you touch on there and i mean you see that in other contexts too you know you know i know like me you have young kids and so you know we have a my son just turned six I have my daughter is eight and one of the things we're in that stage of life where you know we're doing lots of board games with them it's a great learning activity because particularly well, actually for both of them really I think still struggling with the kind of you know if I lose that's so tragic and so awful I have yeah. to you know throw everything in the room and mm-hmm. scream and even lash out and helping mm-hmm. them go there's nothing wrong with wanting to win. I am competitive. My wife will hear she go back and it's Andy's you know a nightmare to play with because because I play to win. But mm. I don't then feel the need 
mm. if I win to sort of then, you know, really take it to the nth degree, or if I lose to sort of lash out. So there's something yeah. about where that line is crossed. But a question I wanted to throw, pick on for for three minutes and, and, and toss around is I'm quite intrigued why I think nationalism nationalism is growing. And I think it is mm. growing. I mean, I mean, even in England where nationalism is frowned upon, you know, people... You know, if if you sort of you know wave a you know wave a St, St. Yeah. St. George's flag, the the white and red thing, you know, people don't look on that so much as a good thing. That's suspicious. Mm-hmm. But here in Scotland, nationalism is kind of everywhere. The saltire, the, the Scottish yeah. flag is flown yeah. everywhere. You know, Scotland this, Scotland the other. Um, Europe, it's definitely growing politically. You know, everyone's sort of saying it's only a matter of time before Marie Le Pen, you know, breaks mm-hmm. through in. In, in, in French politics. In the States, we had Donald Trump, who was more commonly associated with this. And the um, funny thing is, actually, I always think Nicola Sturgeon here in Scotland just reminds me of a female version of Trump. They're equally as shouty. Um, yeah. And I wonder why, A, firstly, why it's growing. And my suspicion, I want to throw a suspicion out, but I'd love you guys to play around with it a bit. Is it because, you know, in these kind of liberal democracies that we live in, they've neglected community as a category. You know, politics for so long has thought of us as autonomous consumers. You know, we treat everyone as little units and that your job as a little unit is to sort of behave yourself and get out there, spend money, keep the economy going and and pay your taxes and get on with it. And we've forgotten, politics has forgotten that community is a category and a lot of nationalism has come along and played off the back of that again. Nationalism gives you that identity. We will glue you together through your race or the place that you live in, because you know you're you're hungering, hungering for and yearning for something mm. bigger. Is that one of the things that's giving some fuel mm. to nationalism? Do you think, or maybe there are other causes? I think there's there's definitely something to that. That there's you know there's that hunger. I don't know whether we could say it's more prevalent now than it's ever been, because I do think that it's kind of always been the case, and not well, well, even even before modern nation states i think you always had tribes or you had cer- certain ways of, of boundaries of, of what uh, or ethnic boundaries whatever they'd be um that sort of separated that and that that they they too bring a sense of belonging don't they in that, that kind of community I, I do think though there's something about modern individualism which is kind of quite unique um historically um compared to sort of pre-modern eras and yeah na- national sort of um endeavors give you a sort of or national sort of flagship uh, movements give you a um a sense of belonging to something far bigger as you say which is certainly got to have something to do with the loss of um sort of religious sort of influence in society as well um so i i forgive me my son my seven-year-old son has just entered the room dressed as a rocket i don't know if that has anything to do with uh anything we've uh been speaking about thus far um but there we are um so the he's joys of podca- the joys of podcasting during uh during lockdowns so. exactly he's gonna zoom off i hope into another room uh yeah there we are um <laughs> i don't he didn't he didn't have a union jack on the rocket so don't worry it wasn't uh, some kind of nationalist uh well you know, we were, we are relieved now that was my number one are. question but, is, is the, uh... <laughs> but just say yeah it, it was interesting that um because we're more individualized and anatomized the way that our consumerism draws us to be more individualistic in, in, in negative ways, as well as the fact that, I mean, I'm all for positive ways of expressing individualism because there are important ways so, so that you're not just drawn into the crowd. But I do think, yeah, there's a way in which we've been almost coaxed into a way of thinking of our, our own selves as the most important autonomous beings from anything else. We're not, we don't need God anymore. We don't need religion anymore. We don't need, um, we don't even need love of our country to some extent. That, that's almost fed into it. So therefore there's a reaction, which is like, wow, gosh, I can actually live for something. I thought I was completely cut off, um, but actually I, I am part of something bigger. And it's funny, George Orwell, one of my favorite um, essays on patriotism is an essay by George Orwell called The Lion and the Unicorn, um, which memorably began with him talking. I think the first line was something like, as I write, there are highly um, civilized people with incredible technology above my head trying to kill me. Because he's writing in 1941, you know, in, in, in during the fear of a uh, uh, German bombing. But he does say in that essay that, that war f- almost reminds you that you're not an individual because you, cause what, what are you going to do in a war situation? You, you presumably have to side somewhere and it makes you think, oh, what do I care about? What do I believe? What do I stand for? What do I want to protect? Am I happy to be taken mm-hmm. over by this other country? Oh, I'm not. Okay, so why do I want to defend my country in whatever way you might you know, mm-hmm. see that, whether however you approach war mm-hmm. or whatever. I, yeah. I think it's interesting that at least there are certain situations, like a war or a conflict or a political kind of turmoil like we've been experiencing, 
which sort of remind you that you're not just an atomized individual, but you are actually part of, or want mm. to be part of some wider, bigger story. Yeah. Mm. Well, that point there, I think, raises a, a fascinating question for me. We touched on it earlier. I think my, maybe Michael, who you who touched on it. Um, obviously, in one sense, we, we, we're wanting to say, you know, nationalism, deeply suspect. And I think we'll shortly get on to some of the particularly Christian concerns, why it's deeply suspect. But patriotism can be a perfectly okay thing, right? To go, so as you say, it's the right thing to do in that kind of situation that George Orwell describes. We think, well, I actually want to be part of this, the, the, you know, this septed isle, and this is something worth worth fighting for. What mm. what is the difference between nationalism and patriotism? Because they're clearly not the same, but there is definitely a spectrum. Um, I think I've got some ideas, but but Michael, what, what what do you think? Nationalism and patriotism. How do we distinguish them? I guess partly I would say maybe patriotism is is a kind of right pride in what is good about one's one's group, one's country, and so on. Um, whereas I think the danger of nationalism is elevating oneself by denigrating others. So you kind of you know it's mm. it's making myself feel special by putting down others. Whereas whereas patriotism is not saying you know <laughs> we are the best country. At, and everything or whatever but it's just saying here are things that we can celebrate about our identity our national identity mm-hmm. and and almost that you would be proud of and want to share with others um as opposed to um here are bad things about other identities and other nations um that i want to point the finger at does, does that make sense so it's, it's a more positive yeah positive thing, i i think it does and you know what's it's interesting um one thing I wonder is, you know, when you've lived abroad, actually, in some ways that helps you see some of that, because I think I think that's that's helpful. I think, you know, I, although I live in Scotland, I, I realise the more I live out of side of England, I am totally English. I'm English to my, to my boots. I love England. There's so much about it, about, you know, the culture and the history and, and things to me that are, are just incredibly, uh, incredibly kind of English. But... Um, but nevertheless, that doesn't mean I want to then start looking down others. I want to get, I want to share those with people. So if I have, you know, Canadian friends or American friends come over, you know, I want to go and show them an English cricket match or a, a cream tea or an English pub or take them walking in the Lake District and share those things. And then conversely, when I go to their countries, I love saying when I, whenever I go traveling, I always love when I visit new countries saying, okay, well, what's the, what, what are the things that you love about your country? What's the, what food should I eat? If I go to a pub, yeah. what beer should I yeah. drink? Cause I want to experience what's great about your, about yeah. your country. And I wonder whether you're exactly right with the patriotism is that I, there's so many things I love. I want to share those with others. I want other people to, to enjoy it, but I don't feel any need you know, for then, you know, my Canadian friends to go back home and start eating English cuisine or, mm. you know, for American friends to start, you know, adopting English spelling, much as we know that English spelling is correct and American spelling <laughs> is horrendous. Um, you know, <laughs> well, so there's something word. about taking, yeah, no, I, I think there's one that maybe there is that something about patriotism, patriotism is that taking a joy in something and, and loving something because it's good and, 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 yeah. and, and, and beautiful and whatnot and say wanting to share rather than close down, put barriers up and go, they are not like us, they are evil. Yeah, it's interesting, Andy. Uh, uh, I really agree with that, and I think this is partly why I was saying, I think we there's a there's a way of us needing to recover a more positive view that that distinguishes it from the kind of acerbic, aggressive, um, dehumanizing forms of nationalism, which kind of want to say we love our own place and our own people, therefore we want to dominate you, um, and we don't, and we don't therefore all, you know equally respect and love and and want to be in, involved in your traditions and things you like. And it's interesting. I've, one of the, there's a famous quote from um, C.S. Lewis's Four Loves here, which I'll just read a, a little bit of, where he talk, he distinguishes between um, patriotism, forms of patriotism or, or nationalism in this sort of way. He says, as the family offers us the first step beyond self-love, so this offers us, this patriotism offers us the first step beyond family selfishness. Of course, patriotism of this kind is not in the least aggressive. It asks only to be let alone. It becomes militant only to protect what it loves. In any mind which has a penny worth of imagination, it produces a good attitude towards foreigners. How can I love my home without coming to realise that other men, no less rightly, love theirs? Um, and so I think there's this element of the family uh, connection there to your country, which is important. And actually, interestingly, that's why. So though patriotism may may seem a mild, you know, a milder kind of step in from nationalism. If you think about the uh, the etymology, the kind of root of the word, patri would would connote father. So it's really like love of the fatherland 
which might sound even more weird and like Nazi-esque. So you kind of don't really want to go there. But at the same time, why is why is this language of family important? There's something about uh, a, a connection to where you're from, the kind of people that you've been dwelling with, the things that you almost as a you know a kind of culture have come to appreciate. And as you say, Andy, mm-hmm. you then can appreciate others, and, and you want to welcome people into those, and then you want to uh, appreciate those when you go somewhere else. The danger is, I think, in our kind of multicultural society, or so called. And this is something I was really alerted to when I read Douglas Murray's uh, The Strange Death of Europe, is that Western civilization, and particularly European civilization, we, we're so embarrassed by our past, by colonialism, slavery, and all these things, we we no longer have the ability or the sort of confidence to proclaim the good things in our own culture. And I, do, I don't think that's a good thing. As much as we may feel like it's we're trying to atone for something, I don't think it's a positive thing for us or for others. And I think Douglas Murray points to the fact that multiculturalism is a sort of ideology that we've sort of bought bought into without really realizing what it means so in this country for example we're telling other cultures to come here and just you know set up shop and do what they want which is great but they're not really buying into multiculture like we are let's say resident natives Mm. originally of, of this nation or this country because what we're saying is we don't really want our culture to be celebrated we want you to celebrate your cultures but we don't want to celebrate ours so that's sort of why you get these more extreme um reactions on the right in this country the, you know let's say at least a portion of the brexit voters would have been frustrated that their what they loved in their country whether they go about it the right way or not is being sort of attacked or is, is being sort of diminished because there's no one really coming up and saying but this is a good thing this is a good englishness can be good or britishness or, yeah. or scottishness whatever you say and so i think that's the kind of danger there's just one more thing i mention would be there, there, this is, was born out in a, a really great church in North London, um, by, led by a guy called Tope Colioso. And he does this thing every year where he celebrates everyone's culture in the church. I think they have 30 odd nationalities represented. It's a wonderful uh, multicultural church um, in the best sense. Um, and every year they have this sort of event where they all wear their kind of national dress and they, they celebrate their foods and they all have a massive kind of party, basically. But he said the hardest people to convince to buy into that is the British. Because they don't want yes. to, he says, come dressed aristocratically or whatever, whatever you think British dress should look like. This guy's Nigerian. Um, and, but they don't want to do it because it's really hard for them to do that. Whereas they're happy to celebrate everyone else's. So I find that an interesting thing that possibly could be redressed, a kind of positive view of patriotism. Yeah. I think there's lots to be, there's lots to be said there. I mean, this is a, maybe a topic for another, another show, but as you were talking there about the whole multicultural piece and, 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 and Murray, Douglas Murray's strange death of Europe, you know, the, I'm always intrigued by this these these two pairings that you hear, you know, thrown around in discussions of this. There's a whole discussion about the uh, you know the somewheres versus anywheres. There there are a group of people in society who who clearly want to they love their culture. They want to they want to actually live where they are and enjoy it and enjoy the things that are good about it. There are others who could actually live anywhere. They could pick their life up and yeah. you could relocate them to any city in the world and it wouldn't and it wouldn't matter uh, mm. because they're perhaps you know they're, they're, everything they're plugged into is global. And I think a lot of the tensions we see in society are between that pairing and then equally in terms of the country and multiculturalism you know difference between folks you know who perhaps you know migrated here or come here or in my, our case we went to Canada for six years who go because you want to make it a home mm. versus you go because you want to make it a hotel. So, you know, mm. when you walk into a hotel, you treat it very differently from your own house because it's just a, just a roof over your mm. head. Whereas when you're building a home, you, you treat it differently. Mm. But I wanted to talk for a few minutes. I was talking for a few minutes because I'm, I'm realizing that, you know, we, we only have a 20 minutes or so left. And boy, we can burn time on this show. Is, um, <laughs> You've got to get your wife out to the restaurant soon. I know. It's, 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 trust me, if I don't finish in 20 minutes time, you know, I've uh, this is our, you know, our 24th year of marriage. I'd like to make 25 and get into the <laughs> restaurant on time tonight is, 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 is very much a, 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 a key part of that to go. Um, my wife is not. She's Swedish. She's not nationalistic, but she's fierce. If you know, I miss date night. Um, <laughs> so where was I? Yes. So thinking about some of the some of the things that I think are problematic with nationalism, because I'm 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 still genuinely staggered that I know people here in Scotland who would see no problem with being nationalistic. I know I know there are Christian uh, members of of Parliament, you know, here who are members of the Scottish National Party, and and it sort of boggles my mind that somebody might line themselves up that way. I so, say, you know, my great political hero is William Wilberforce, who, you know, famously was apolitical. He would not join a political party because he thought that was selling out. But I would be interested for us to explore for a few minutes, you know, what are perhaps some of the explicitly Christian problems where patriotism mm. tips over into nationalism? My suspicion is the big one is idolatry that we, you know, as 
as Luther, I think, famously said, you know, the human heart is an idol-making factory, mm-hmm. and we have a tendency yeah. to bring things into the centre of our lives that that really that should be God's place. And my hunch is that nationalism does that with tribe. Do you think that's a fair critique from a Christian point of view, and therefore we should be very nervous about, you know, basically get, ascribing homage to our country in a way we should really be ascribing it to God? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I guess I would see it as kind of connected with our sense of identity. Um, so so what we idolise becomes foundational to who we are, um, to to our sense of, of identity. And, and obviously, if it becomes idolatrous, it becomes kind of ultimate or fundamental to who we are. And I guess there's two, two dangers, aren't there, when it comes to identity and it comes to kind of what is the foundation of our lives. One would be to become a kind of nationalist who makes... Um, kind of national identity, everything. And and in place of God and my identity as a Christian, as if that's more important. Um, or the other mistake would be to go to kind of the opposite extreme and to relegate it to become nothing and to say, this is not part of my identity at all. And I think sometimes people can be super spiritual, can't they? They can say, you know, my identity is in Christ, nothing else really matters. And I think, right, you're not a, a father, a wife, a mother, a husband, a, 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 a whatever. There's lots of things that make up our identity. That's not wrong. Because... Um, Things that are idolatrous aren't necessarily in and of themselves wrong. It's it's the level that we place them at. Um, and so I'd say um, mm. our national identity is part of who we are. Um, it's not something we choose, but it's something that's kind of given to us um, in a sense by our upbringing. But um, we can elevate it to become too important or we can relegate it to say it's of no importance. And actually the truth is somewhere in between those two extremes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's interesting that, that I say, Michael, that there's something about just thinking of the um, the sort of New Testament approach to the nations as a kind of category is interesting. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we have because we have the biblical mandate of, well, the biblical sort of story of Israel as the chosen nation. But then they were always meant to be a witness to the nations around them. And of course, mm-hmm. in, the, in the, you know, that, that comes out of the out of the old covenant and then, and then into the new. You have this emphasis on in a way nations don't matter anymore, which is why some people kind of go, you know, all of those ethnic boundaries, uh, boundaries when it comes to the gospel are completely overcome. And that's why Paul, you know, has a go at Peter, especially in Galatia um, for sort of associating um, with, with with people of, of, a, of a different ethnic background. Of course, he's, he's the Judaizers. Um, and yet at the same time, it's funny how that there is, almost a positive celebration of nations being different and, and the tribes. So it's not just that we say, right, we just, for want of a better word, for want of a much better word, we whitewash all of um, all of the distinctives of peoples and people groups. I feel like there's something about the glory of the gospel mm. which brings the colour of different um, tribes together. And it's actually in their difference, in their unified difference, that God is more glorified rather than we don't care about anything earthly anymore because we're all, as you say, spiritualized. We're all kind of just basically living like angels who don't have any rootedness in, in what it is to live in this world. I don't think that that is really true. But I think the better thing is when you say, look, those earthly things don't hold me down uh, when it comes to how I think about the, my identity in Christ. And it's interesting. I, I, I was been, I've been sort of teaching hymns to my children over the last few years, which has been really, really great fun. Mm-hmm. Trying to remember ones that I sung as, as a boy. And uh, even before I was a Christian, I sung hymns and I remembered them, but, you know, didn't know what they meant at the time. And one of them that came to mind recently, I had to think, oh, shall I, am I allowed to teach this to them? Was the I vow to thee my country. Hmm. Because it's a weird one, which we really wouldn't sing. Because the first, you know, it's it's a one that could easily be instrumentalized for sort of nationalistic spirit. Um, so I vowed, you know, I vowed to thee my country, all earthly things above, entire and whole and perfect to the service of my love. It's an odd thing when, yet I did appreciate when I read through it, the second verse of that hymn is, you know, and there's another country I've heard of long ago, most dear to, to them that love her, most great to them that know. We may not count her armies. We may not see her king. Her fortress is a faithful heart. Her pride is suffering, etc. And I think there's an interesting paradox there, which is mm-hmm. you can actually have a rooted identification with your national identity or maybe, let's say, your country, your your culture, but yet it's subservient, it's subordinate to this other country, this greater city. So, you know, ultimately think of Hebrews 12. We're here, mm. we have no, old 13 is, here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Or Paul saying in Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. Um, he's, and he you know, directly tells Timothy not to get embroiled or entangled in civilian affairs. 
because you're part of another kingdom. So we must remember that our first identity is, is part of the kingdom of God. He's our, our captain and our king. And yet, yeah, there's something still related to, to the glory of that in, in the bringing together of the nations, which is a, such a big theme in the New Testament, in the, well, the whole Bible. I, I, that's, I think that's really helpful, actually, Aaron. And I think it's obviously tying into what Michael was saying as well, that I think, you know, the thing about idols, I think in my mind, right, is to go that so many, so many idols are things that are perfectly okay when they're, when they're in their place. But as you say, when you elevate them and they become the main thing, that's when suddenly they become monstrous. And we can do that with you know, politics, we can do it with nation, we can do it with family, we can do it with, with sexuality and all kinds of things. And I wonder whether, you know, when nationalism is potentially so, so dangerous is that, you know, we live in this world where I think many people have forgotten the transcendent, but mm. that doesn't change the fact they need to be plugged into something bigger than them. And nationalism is one of many isms. I forget who it was who said this. Somebody, I'm reading somebody once who had this lovely line where they said, you know, ideas very quickly become uh, ideals and ideals become mm. idealisms. Mm. And any ism has a tendency to get sucked into that transcendent void and become mm. transcendentalized, and then all hell mm. breaks loose. Mm. Um, mm. quite literally sorry Michael you were going to say something there and I've got well, an no, that, I've got say, one last question thinking biblically on that. yeah just, just thinking biblically on that it's interesting because you've got you know Paul saying you know there's no male female Jew Gentile we're all one in Christ Jesus and sometimes people can take that verse to mean like you know therefore you know these these markers have no importance, but of course they do. I'm still, as a Christian, I'm still a man. Uh, I'm still male. Um, uh, and I still have a national identity. And it's interesting because you know, in Revelation, John sees this vision of people from every tribe, nation, and language. And so, well, how did he know yes. that? Like, clearly, they had identifying things about them that made them visibly different from other people. There was still difference yeah. there in this vision yeah. of the new creation. But these yeah. differences were not differences that, caused them to be divided but there were differences that were celebrated yeah. and the, the thing that united them was more important than the thing that actually divided them yeah and I think mm. that's what that, we're saying yeah, that, Christians, we celebrate our differences but yeah. we're united by something bigger that celebrating difference is interesting because i you know i've had one or two debates here with sort of nationalistic folks saying that you know i you know generally politically i'm i'm, I'm in favor of devolving power downwards so you know I'm, I, I would be potentially very open to the idea of theoretically of scottish independence but i would be looking for it to be presented in that very positive kind of way of going you know we love england we just don't want to be you know saddled in a political union with them because we love scotland and to go we just want the freedom for both nations to flourish and do their own you could do that very positive very very positive yeah. kind of way that celebrates yeah. a difference rather than a kind of like well we hate the other lot so uh, we want to carve out our own yeah. space which brings me i guess the last kind of thing that strikes me around around the issues to be aware of for, for Christians sort of dabbling and then the thing that smells of nationalism is, of course, I'm struck by when you think biblically on this, of course, for me, one of the huge messages of the gospel is that it bridges divides. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that message that, you know, you, you alluded it to there, Michael, I think that, that verse, there is no, in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, male or female, uh, you know, Spurs or Liverpool supporter. And um, <laughs> that's 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 a, that's a, that's that's not in the original Greek. And uh, but uh, that idea that it brings people together. And so, as Christians, we should surely be people who are about bringing people together. And so, I've often thought, you know, you know, if you're a Christian, uh, you know, involved in politics, say, you know, it should be a sobering reminder to you that you have more, you are closely, more closely related to somebody on the other side of the issue. So, you know, I've said this, I've challenged friends who are into the whole independence thing here in Scotland are going, you know, your friends in the who are against Scottish independence, if they are Christians, they are family in a way that your fellow political mm. members who are not Christian mm. aren't. And yeah. if you forget that, yeah. then you have literally at that point, I think, betrayed the gospel. Mm. Um, there is no there is no uh, there is no way of beating around that particular bush. Anything that we let come between us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. I mean, if there's one message the New Testament bangs out with regularity, it's Christian unity, 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 yeah. unity. And uh, that doesn't mean we don't we don't disagree. It doesn't mean we can't have different opinions. But if at the end of it, we can't put our arm around one another as long as the COVID restrictions <laughs> allow hugging and um, then we have a problem. Right. Mm. Yeah. Just to. Just a kind of beautiful story on that, really, it was a few years ago, I was um, speaking at a conference um, for the Eurasian student movement, so kind of former Soviet countries. And going, I remember just there was a real sense of tension at the beginning, because it was just after 
Um, Crimea had been annexed and there was war between Ukraine and Russia. And we had students coming from Ukraine. We had students coming from Russia. Uh, we also had students coming from Azerbaijan and we had students coming from Armenia. So here we had you know, four nations um, where there's real mm. conflict and tension. And, and actually wow. these students were meeting each other for the very first time. Um, so they'd never, you know, some of them, you know, particularly those in Azerbaijan and Armenia, had never met Christians from the other other side. Um, and mm. it wasn't that like we all just arrived and, hey, we're all just going to get on really easily. You know, there, there was real tensions to work through because of the history, because of, you know, um, perceptions of the other. But to see over the course of the week that actually what united us was more important than what divided us. And to see these yeah. students starting to get to know each other and and actually develop real relationships as the week went on was a really beautiful yeah. thing um yeah. see the power of the gospel in that way and as yeah. for me one of my joys yeah. working kind of internationally particularly in parts of the world like that or in the balkans as well i think of friends who you know were at war with each other within my memory in my lifetime um who are working together and there's still generally in those nations a lot of animosity because of the very recent history and yet yeah. to see how the gospel has elevated something to become more important than what would divide them and I think that's a helpful yeah. reminder for us. Yeah. And I found I've learned a lot from them. Yeah. Yeah. So no, sorry. Yeah. Jump in, just jump in on that. I, I was, it reminded me of a, uh, there's a, a leadership conference that New Frontiers used to do every year where I was from in Brighton, um, which was a gathering of about 10,000 leaders from around the world. And they had f- just such a, a variety of nations represented. And they had flags always draped around, flags of, of many nations just draped around the whole arena. Again, not to, emphasize the differences well in a way to show that there are differences but then to emphasize that they're all differences together they're all unified and the kind of tagline was together on a mission and you know this this sense of we can do more together than we can do apart and i think that's just such a big part of what god's plan is isn't it it's his plan for as i say for israel to to be the light to the nations but then to bring the nations together and we see that at pentecost don't we with all of those different tongues being spoken to those people who are gathered in Jerusalem mm. from v- vastly different places, who then are able to hear the, this this wonderful kind of expression of God God's revelation, mm. which then kind of the gospel kind of goes from there uh, around the world to the ends of the earth, yeah. as Jesus says. And I think there's something really important about that that we that that we kind of get hold of this sort of again glor- glorifying um, the unification, the diverse, genuine unity and diversity mm. which we want to see in, yeah. in the gospel. Well, I think the thing is, you as you as you talk there, and this is a massive theological idea to to to, to throw in the last five minutes. But um, but to go, you know, one of my favourite kind of theologians for for some years has been Colin Gunton. Um, you know, the systematic kind of theologian who was at King's College, and then you know, sort of died sort of mm. sadly in his early fifties, with still a lot of work ahead of him. Okay. But uh, you know, for for Colin's big idea and so much of his work was that the the, the Trinity, the nature of God, is both uh, is you know unity within diversity. That the Father is not the Son, is not the Spirit, yeah. um, but together they form. You know, those three persons make up one one God. And then we, as human beings, being made in His image, yeah. there should be something about us that reflects that unity and diversity. And um, his book, the one, the three, and the many, that really unpacks the Trinity and its implications, what it means to be human. You know, is a book that made a huge impact on me because I think you know running through that is a theme that, that there are there are sort of two, quite frankly, demonic tendencies in, in culture one is to rip us apart and that's kind of you know just to be the, the diversity with nothing holding us together and you mm-hmm. can see that sort of tribalism uh in, in tri- political tribalism you can also see it in rampant individualism but of course the other is to squish all the differences together into into unity and to go you know for perhaps the state to get it into its head that its job is to be supreme and squash everything and we see that in many totalitarian societies we talked last week about totalitarianism and, you know, Colin in that book, again, the, the plea for Christians and particularly Christian communities like churches to model, what does it mean for there to be diversity, but with unity? Yeah, as you say, we come from different nations and different backgrounds, but we are one in, we are one in Christ. Mm-hmm. And the, what a model that is to the, to the world, because I think, mm-hmm. yeah, I think people do know there is something beyond rampant individualism. I think people do, you know, appreciate that, uh, that totalitarianism is not the best there is, but I think people are looking for models. Mm. And I think there's a real opportunity for Christians to go, this is what it means to live as God's people in this world and to try and bring folks together, as you say, but without stamping on the differences. Mm. That's right. So it's funny, on that, Andy, it's so interesting. It reminds me of a famous quote from uh, Napoleon when he was sort of exiled towards the end of his life. 
and he developed this kind of profound appreciation for Christ as a as the greatest leader, the greatest commander ever, because by the gentleness of the Christian faith, he's managed to conquer many nations in ways that Napoleon, with all of his great military strength, was unable to do. He couldn't even conquer, you know, tried to kind of get as far as Russia um, and couldn't, but was still, you know, is still hailed as one of the great commanders of, of, uh, of people. And yet Christ as the kind of ultimate commander, but in such a different way to any way that the world would think to try to kind of conquer nations, as it were, the gospel has done so mm. in, in powerful and unique ways by going almost underneath the usual ways the world yeah. works. I think that's um, that's a great place to end it, actually. Uh, quite frankly, you know, we 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 began with uh, we began with modern politicians. We've ended with Napoleon Bonaparte. We've been through a, a whole range of things uh, in the middle, and uh, which reminds me, incidentally, and a good place to end. My 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 eight year old daughter's favourite joke right now, which she did not get from me, is what happens if you throw a hand grenade into a French apartment? You get linoleum blown apart. <laughs> That is absolutely terrible. That, that, that's a, not a dad joke. I don't know what is. Well, before the puns get any worse and uh, Michael starts baking sourdough. You save this uh, for your night of, out, Andy, yeah. I should, exactly. And before one of your children comes in, dress as a rocket or as Batman <laughs> or as both, uh, that is it from us. So thank you uh, for to listening for listening to Part of the Gaps. I hope that what we've discussed has been interesting and thought-provoking and uh and whatever and if you've got topics that you would love uh, myself and uh and aaron and uh michael to talk about do let us know we're on social media you can find us certainly on facebook we we hang out there you can find all three of us on on, on twitter we are twits as well as facebookers and uh, if there are topics you'd love us to dig into do uh do let us know and if you want sourdough recipes michael is your man uh but otherwise it's a uh, goodbye from me and a goodbye from these gentlemen too and we'll see you next time on Pot of the gaps farewell bye